What's good with it, y'all? This is your man Tadashi, and you are tuned in to another episode of The Dash, where we want to help people think critically about themselves and the world around them. I'm so excited for you to jump in and join us. Listen, if you have not been listening to season two yet, you tripping. We just getting started. There's so much in store. A lot of good things happening. So I I dropped an EP called This Time Around 2. The first EP I did this time around, which is the first one, uh, I I basically wanted to make music that was sonically and um, thematically, like lyrically, something that would stand the test of time. I wanted to do something really to prove to myself that I could still do this. I was going through a hard time in my life after the loss of my son. I was questioning a lot when it came to who I was as a person, my identity, and music was a part of that. And I was like, man, if this sucks, like I'm out. I don't want to do it no more. But if it doesn't suck, if I can still do this, then God, maybe you got more for me. So through making music and praying and talking with friends and seeking counsel, I kept pushing forward and doing it. And I came out with three to four of the biggest songs of my career on this one EP. And so this second time around, this time around too, I'm doing similar music where I'm trying to make things that are timeless and yet still relevant. But beyond that, now I'm in this mindset where I go, I want to push the envelope a little more with the dialogue around it. That's why I'm doing season two. Season one was about one of the songs called Mirror Talk, but season two is about the entirety of this idea of this music that I do. So in order to help do that, in order to have that conversation, in order to think critically about it, I got a special guest with me today in the building. Y'all make some noise for my man one time, Aha Gazelle. What's up with it, bruh? Oh, what's good? What's good? Glad to be here. Honored to be here. Appreciate the invite. Um, I'm excited, man. I'm ready to get into it. Man, look, bruh, I'm grateful that you decided to do it, that you jumped on with me. There's this... There is this idea that I have in my head of still wanting to do a cookout with you, bro. Like that is, <laughs> I'm not playing. Like when you was living here in Atlanta and we talked about it a lot of like, man, we got to do something at the house, do something at the house. And it never happened. But I just got a feeling, bro, like between you in the kitchen, me in the kitchen, and maybe some of your homies down there and, and some of my friends here, I'm like, bro, I feel like we would do some epic. All we need is, is uh, Derek Minor, bro. It would be epic. He can cook. Derek, can he cook? Derek Miner. I, I, I don't know. I don't bro, know. <laughs> first of all, Derek Miner can cook, but he okay. he got some of the best barbecue I ever had. Oh, for, for sure. For real, bro. Okay. Derek Miner, when he when he get on the grill, when he get on the smoker, like it's a wrap. I'm blown away. I'm I've only had his food, his I've only had his barbecue once, but I remember okay. it so vividly. I'm like, every time I go to Nashville, I'm just like, yo, you, 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 you smoking something? You on the grill? What you doing? <laughs> Like now you, I know. Now you know, I, I bro. The loop. I listen, was out the loop. I listen, know now. Dude, when you I know go, who hit him up, bro. The dude is okay. amazing, bro. But I, t- I always told him, I was like, bro, we need to start a barbecue restaurant. And he started laughing. But I'm for <laughs> real, man. I feel like if me, you, him, your homies down there, my people here hey, got I'm, together. I'm honored. I'm honored that you put me as the chef. <laughs> I don't know if it's just because I'm from Louisiana. I don't know what it is. But hey, look, I am honored to be there. I'm going to just learn from y'all. But look. My partner, Big Dog, you met Big Dog, yeah, I know right? Big Dog. He's the cook. For He's real. The chef. Like anything that I that I pick up is is like, hey, Big Dog, check this out. And so uh, I do enjoy cooking, and I just I've been taking it one thing at a time. And yeah. so like right now, my main dish is gumbo. Like Man. I know how to make gumbo from scratch with the flour, the roux, like everything. Look, bro, so. we was talking about gumbo a little bit when you popped on to join me and Alexis last time. Like it. That was a yeah. that was a moment. I'm just I I'm not, but it wasn't because of that moment. I'm serious. When you was here, I came in the studio one night and I was like, "Yo, man, I want to work and like get y'all to the crib so we can do a cookout." And yeah. and it was one of the moments where I just felt like you, maybe it's because you're from Louisiana, but I think it's more so because you're from the South. I'm like, you yeah. would know, you would know oh, what yeah, to do. Yeah. You would appreciate what we do. Like my mama raised me. My mama was like, "Baby, you eat too much." For some woman to want to cook for you, you need to learn how to cook for yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now that's that's really, that's really how it starts. That's how it like, starts. <laughs> in the kitchen, nobody's there. It's like the chicken's in the freezer. What you gonna do? What you gonna do, bro? And then at some point, you you do it, but you like it's got to taste good. At some point, I got to figure it out. So you get better and better. So okay. so you on the gumbo game? No, I need to. I, I'm I'm about to try to do a gumbo real soon because. 
yeah. um, I'm trying to get ready. Every Christmas, every Christmas Eve in my family, like if we was in Louisiana with my un- and with my auntie and my uncle, every Christmas Eve, it was a pot of gumbo. Like yeah. every Christmas Eve, yeah. a pot of gumbo made. Why they in there baking cakes and doing everything else? The gumbo on the stove. You just go get some rice, get the gumbo, and you that's what you eating all day because we ain't doing nothing else. Christmas is when we're going to eat the rest of the food. So knowing that I want to do that here with my family, I'm like, man, every Christmas Eve, we're going to have gumbo. We're going to do it. And so I'm practicing now. But but you the one that you like, you 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 pretty confident in yours. Yeah, so like I'm on a quest. So like um, when I had moved back to New Orleans, uh, I always felt like Katrina kind of robbed me of my full New Orleans experience yeah. as far as like my childhood. It's because the majority, it was like split half. Um, and so the other half of my childhood was in North Louisiana. Right. So I really like, I feel like I'm a mixture of both because they're very different. It's like two different states in one state with Louisiana. It's right. crazy. Right. And so um, I started with gumbo. That was my first. I said, I just want to learn how to make gumbo. Like yeah. that was kind of my whole. I was like, I want to, because I've always heard different people. It's like, you can't eat everybody gumbo and everybody don't make it right. And some yeah. people, you know, and so um, my dad used to make gumbo all the time growing when we was growing up. And so I think it was a combination of both of those things. Like one kind of taking up the mantle. And even my brother knows how to make gumbo. He can yeah. make gumbo too. This is kind of like, that was what started. So you but next. I was trying to learn it all. I want to do red beans. That's next on the list. Yeah, I want to learn how to make some good red beans. And then I want to learn how to make... Um, I'm trying to perfect my fried catfish. Ooh, on like a, yeah, because <laughs> that's my that's my go to yeah. meal. Go with a side of fried catfish. Yeah, that's my bro. favorite. Like, that's that's yeah. hard. That's I love that dudes out here, artists in different ways. We more than just on the mic. This man is in the kitchen, hey, killing, he's trying it. to get the. I love and TikTok that. really changed the game though. No, for real, TikTok, TikTok recipes dang. changed the game, bruh. Everything. I was like, oh, this is what y'all do? I, I could do this. I went over, bro, I went over to Andy's house and uh, we were talking and his wife was like, yeah, this is a TikTok recipe. I was like, wait, what? Like TikTok changed the game, bro. She put me on. So I started I started watching. I was like, I'm going to try. Yeah. Everybody say it. They see it on TikTok. They're like, oh, I'm going to try that. Man, I got a folder full of things I'm supposed to try. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good, bro. So, so listen, man, I'm... I'm excited you're here because there's a lot I want to talk about that I think you're going to have a particular vantage point on that would bless us, that would help us tremendously. But before we jump into that, just tell me, man, where you been? What's been going on? How is life just professionally, personally? Like, how you doing, bro? Where you been? Um, I mean, I can't, I can't complain about much. It's been a lot, I mean, yeah. between the, the pandemic and... Uh, Shoot, everything else that's just been going on with the country and, and personal life. It's just been a lot. Yeah. I was uh I had moved back to New Orleans um during the pandemic. Okay. That was like mid-2020. Moved back down there. I was down there for two years. And I just recently moved back to the crib. Um, mainly because I'm getting married in two weeks. What? So, let's go. Yeah. Let's go. I knew yeah. that, but come on, bro. Let's go. <laughs> come on, bro. We're gonna talk about that too. We're gonna talk about that too. Go ahead though. Yeah, that's really that's really been a highlight for me as uh, as of now. Um, I'm excited about that. It's, it's been a lot of maturing on my part. Yeah, a lot of growing up. Um, as far as music goes, I mean, I can't complain about that at all. I mean, guys just been opening doors. That's dope. Um, bro. I, I recently had a song. Um, I got a song called "Tear Down" that was on my spin. I yep. dropped a mix last year. It just yep. got on 23, so that was a big Jeez. look for me. Um, I got some other stuff I can't really quite speak on all yeah. the way, but yeah. everything is good. I can't complain. Um, honestly, I'm just I'm just excited. I'm trying to um, I've been trying to like grow. Yeah, like I don't want to get stagnant. I'm trying to like focus on consistency. Yeah, uh, trying to work on like I, I've pretty much mastered it as far as getting up and going to the gym and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, but I'm trying to like use that same thing and apply it to. You know, spending time with God yeah. or spending time with uh, Kiwan or my fiance, yeah. or you know, even going to the studio. You know how it is, an artist. Some days, me yeah. personally, I get burnt out, and so sometimes I play the game all day and not right. even record. You're right. But I was reading somewhere that was like, you can't wait for inspiration. You gotta, yeah. so you know, like we go to the gym and we don't feel like it, don't we? That's real. You're right. That's so exactly it's like, it. 
but I don't look at it like that, but I'm trying to get there. You know yeah. what I'm saying? That's real, bro. I, I had yeah. a person tell me one time, bro, he said, uh, intention informs inspiration. And I was mm. like, what? He was like, uh, bro, yo, you set your intentions on doing it, and the intention brings the inspiration when you need it. Because sometimes inspiration alone ain't enough. If it's if I, I might feel inspired on Monday, but Tuesday I might not be. And you'd be Thanks. like, what's the difference between yesterday and today? It's the same, like I'm just going to the gym. Like, what's up? But if I set my intention every day to show up there and I pull up, then I'm mm -hmm. going to go in there and do something. So like today for me, that was, that was I did not feel like going, bro. I was like, no, nah, I just want to go home, get some more sleep. Yeah. I got to film, I got to record. But I was like, nope. Pull up. My intention is to is to drive and park every day at the gym. And as soon oh, as I yeah. park there, I'm like, well, I'm here now. Let's go. I'm here now, <laughs> I'm man. Here now. Yeah. Let's do Thanks. it. But yeah, Thanks. man, he was like, intention informs inspiration. And I was like, yo, that's 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 for me. That's where I am in life now. So so you own your sure. gym game. You own your, your your kitchen game. You you getting you getting in, you getting married like that's Kiwana. Yeah, her name is Kiwana. Kiwana. So, so how how I long have you known her? How did y'all meet? Like, give us if you anything uh, you feel. We, we any, let me say it a different way. Anything she feels comfortable with you sharing, like let us know. <laughs> oh, no, nah, yeah, no, we good. So, um, we actually believe it or not, we went to high school together. Oh, don't. Um, but but we didn't really have a relationship in high school. Yeah, it was just like um, she knew me. Of course, she knew my dad. Um, yeah. because she also went to our church as well. Okay, okay. All right. So she was a member of the church, but we went to school together. But again, we didn't have like that type of relationship until um, until we both graduated high school. She's ahead of me, so she had graduated. But it was really after I when I went to college. Yeah, that was when uh, we became friends. Um, I had started a praise team at the church. Yeah, and so I was trying to get singers in the church. You know, it's a small church. Shout out Greater Pleasant Grove. You heard me. Let's you, go. You, them. And so it's a small church. So I'm just, you know, anybody who's willing to sing. And so she was one of the ones singing. And so from that, we uh, became friends. Wow. And, it's kinda, and we've been, we were friends for a long time. I mean, she uh, went to different schools. You know what I'm saying? I said that on, it's on I owe you Jack when I said, uh, yeah, I go to ground, but I got a girl from Tech. Yeah, she yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> she went hard. to Tech. And so, yeah, we was friends for a long time. And then uh, we actually had made it official. Uh, I was in Atlanta. It was 2017 yeah. when we actually started dating, uh, December 2017. And then we dated for five years as like boyfriend and girlfriend. Yeah. And I proposed last July on the man, 23rd. Man, bro, congratulations, man. Yeah. I love it. So what, it. what's been your biggest lesson from having a relationship go from dating to, to engagement? Like what's been, you know, looking at marriage coming in a couple, like like what's been the biggest lesson for you as a person? Not necessarily you two dating or being together, but you as a person, like what's been the biggest lesson? Um, I mean, I could even take it back because it was it's weird because like we was legit best friends yeah. before we got in a relationship. So I had to transition because it's like, even as friends, there's a level of, uh, I guess romanticism that was never really required. Right. So once we had a relationship, I had to turn that on, mm. and that was that was something that I learned about myself. I guess that is dealing with our relationship, but that that yeah. is just something that I realized for you as a person, and, though. Yeah. And then other than that, most of the time she's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's real. Look, hey, I'm, that's yeah. real. Switching gears a little bit, I want to jump into this conversation that I've been having with people on the podcast. So talk this, talk this music, <laughs> about talk this, this music, music. bro. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. So Christian hip hop, right? So I have come to the, the, the belief within myself that Christian hip hop is not a genre of its own. As much as we say it, as much as we call it that, I don't believe it's a genre in and of itself because I don't believe that it has the infrastructure set up enough for it to be autonomously its own thing. It can anything can be something if you call it that. Like I can I can take a stool and call it a table and it be it be a table. You know, you in college, you got a you got a dinner tray that sit up on some legs. When you're done with dinner, you just slide it to the side of the couch and now it's an end table. Like you know, you can make something right. be something. But for all intents and purposes in my mind what we do is hip hop. And then mm -hmm. through hip hop we are a sect or a, a subculture of hip hop, sub genre of hip hop, more than our own independent genre. Um, genres, in my opinion, were started because 
people were loving the sound coming from a particular way of music. And then people in big buildings with, with, with tall glass windows said, hey, we need to categorize this so we can figure out who this is for. And then we can sell it and make money off of it. We can get concerts going and make money off of it. And so genres came about because of people people's desire to classify. We took on that identity of classification, in my opinion, and we called it Christian hip hop for distinction, but also because we wanted to have a name that made sense for what we did, um, mm -hmm. because we didn't want to be just called hip hop for 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 the faith element that that we brought to our music. Um, but I've come to this place where I personally think Christian hip hop is not its own genre; it's just hip hop, and because of that we need to recognize what needs to be done in order for it to be its own genre. I personally think it needs to have infrastructure where you can find, like if a kid at your, your daddy's church wants to become a rapper, well then where do they go? Where is the label? Where is the booking agency? Where is the manager? Where is the venue? Where is the promoter? Where is the, like who are these people that they can go to? They don't exist. In order for mm -hmm. them to have something, they either got to become gospel, stay in youth group world, or go be CCM and get adopted by another genre that exists with infrastructure in order to be something. And I feel like knowing your journey a little bit, I feel like you may have experienced that or seen that. So I'll, 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 I'll stop right there for now and just like, man, give me what you think about what I said, but your own insight into what you feel like Christian hip hop is overall. Oh man, <laughs> a million dollar question. Um, I mean, me personally, uh, I definitely think more than anything, I've always looked at it as a denomination. Okay, okay. And the reason I compare it to a denomination uh, more than anything else is because uh, it's that's the that's the most similar thing it is to me. Um, I've never it, heard this before, but this is so good, bro. Go ahead, go ahead. Because it's almost like, um, you know, you're a believer. Yeah. I'm a believer. Yeah. But we could have been in two different denominations and have a completely different experience on what church is, right? So real. So real. And so that's how I look at that because, like, for me, it was always gospel rap. Yeah. I had never, it was never Christian hip hop. It was gospel rap. Right. And so, like, I'm talking, like, because I'm, I'm a preacher's kid raised in the church. And so, um, you know, music was always, like, I went to a full gospel. I went to Bishop Paul S. Morton Church. Okay. And so, you you know, if like, bro, their music, I'm talking like probably the best in the world. Yeah, like, bro. open the floodgates of heaven. I saw that live. Like, yeah. as a kid growing up, I'm listening to this. And so music was naturally like always a thing. So I'm playing saxophone in fifth grade, playing drums. And uh, by the time I'm 10, and then, so it was always for me, it was like from a musical journey, my roots are gospel. Yeah. You know? And it's gospel. And then on top of that, it was like stuff like Luther Vandross, Earth, yeah. Wind and Fire, yeah. um, Nita Baker, uh, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson. My dad is a big Michael Jackson fan. Right. So like my dad is a preacher. Right. He's a big Michael Jackson fan. Right. So immediately I could say like I never I don't think I ever had the world view of like the secular versus, versus the sacred. Yeah. Versus the, it was always just good music, bad music. Right. Right. It was always that was always my and I think that's a, a major part of my influence or how I always saw it. But to get back to kind of what you were saying, like it was always gospel rap. So if I'm in church, I remember the first gospel rap I ever um heard of. It was my my dad went to this conference. He brought us back a CD from somebody named Ben Sent. Okay. I think he's from from Detroit. I don't even know. I, I never even tried to Google him. Like, yeah. I just remember his name because my brother's name is Benjamin. And so his name being Ben Sent, it was yeah. just like, oh, it just hey. stuck with and you. So he, and he was, and he could flow as far yeah. as I remember. And so then my dad bought me a CD called Gospel Gangsters. Yeah, yeah. Gospel Gangsters. I think they had a, a I can see clearly now. I can That's see the clearly name. now. Yeah. Bruh, they was on. That is some of the, that is one of the best rap albums to this day. To I this encourage day. any person who love hip hop to turn that on. But if you listen to that project, I mean they they dropping in bombs. I don't know yeah. what I can say. I don't say nothing. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. So they got they had the n word. It's like there was everything they was saying. It was like. But gospel, it was yes. like they was preaching the gospel, they were sharing the gospel, and then they were real game bangers who who got saved. Yeah, so you, I'm listening to stuff, but I'm like, yo, y'all, where y'all getting these stories from? Like y'all really was was outside for real. Yeah, and so that kind of for show com combined with Kurt Franklin, that's that's Ahagzel. 
That's so that's dope. like that's, that's it. the that's the you know. Do you want a revolution? I'm listening to that, and, and on that CD, there's a skit on the CD. Uh, it's funny because few a uh, few got a similar skit on his album that right, just dropped. Right, but it was basically they was like mad at Kirk Franklin. It's like who we think he is. Yep, he makes this type of music, and th- that ain't church. Turn on some James Cleveland because yep. I guess James Cleveland was the premier gospel. He was the standard. Uh, it was the standard at that time, and so I'm listening to that. I'm growing up to that, and so I always, I only know radical. That's all I know. Yeah, bro. Like I only know, like, like that's probably why I'm such a. I'm, a, I'm. He tripping. I don't know. I don't know what he got going, but I'm a Kanye <laughs> fan. You know, what I'm saying I ain't. I don't switch up on people so quick. You that's know what real. I'm saying? That's real. But you know, like I, he that radical. Just like I don't care what everybody else got going. Like if this is, I mean, so to get back that. I think is my thing when I got introduced to Reach and I guess the, I don't know what I would call it. I guess the CHH as we know it. Right. It was it was a different world. It was yeah. completely. I mean, I mean, I'm skipping through stuff. I've had so many gospel rappers come to church. Shout out Big Al. Shout out. It's a cat named New Orleans named Var G. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I yeah. know for a fact most people probably don't know who they are. Like right. as far as Christian hip hop goes, and so to me. I look at Christian hip hop, like I said, a denomination because yes. that doesn't mean that they not booming. Big Al sell our shows. Big yeah. Al and RG was that was doing shows. They was going from church to church. They got you know they made me a fan. So yeah, I'm just bro. like see all of these people and then to come to this other space where like it's a completely different group of people and a, it's really a different market. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We combine the the business side of it. It's just kind of like. That's why I look at it like a denomination. It's that's like so profound, bro. Ooh. Yeah. No, that's a great breakdown. You you just gave me so much clarity in some of the things that I'm thinking through. Listen, bro, like to, to, to kind of tie in what you were saying before, like I'm grateful for my wife. I, I know you're grateful for your fiance. Like having, we all have blind spots. Like there are things we can't see. And you mm-hmm. get the chance to, have her in your corner to point out those like you like I got five things right now I know and it's like yeah. she saw what you couldn't see you got blind spots my wife the same way but in this conversation part of the reason I bring it up is because I know I have blind spots so I'm like yo give me your insight give me your thoughts you do this like give me your wisdom in it but what I'm starting to, to recognize based on what you were saying <clears throat> there's a um there is a de- there's a de- delineation between gospel rap and christian hip hop and you are you are so correct like i i remember when i first started trying to rap um it was at, of course at church and i was going to greater zion missionary baptist church in huntsville texas and they would let me rap with the youth and i would rap sometime on sunday like the, i'm singing in the choir and then they give me a mic and i start rapping and then that pass it back um and i remember that not being what we call christian hip hop today I didn't even know that was a thing until I heard of Cross Movement because they Mm -hmm. were the ones branding it as Christian hip hop. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, but you are right. There is a difference and a distinction because, and I mean, you know, part of the distinction to me is denominationally, as you put it, I'm like, you have your missionary Baptist churches that are predominantly black. And then you got your, you know, Bible slash, um, uh, reform circle churches that are predominantly white, and there's a different expression within the music. Some get accepted a certain way, some do not. But I just remember before being a part of Reach and having a, a, an, an expression that was more in line with what Crossman was doing, I was definitely in a gospel rap world, rapping mm-hmm. for God, but doing it like the gospel gangsters, doing it like, um, you said, Vargi. His name, so it was a, I'm I'm going because it's lit, literally like five five rappers I remember in church. Yeah, that I, that like I first was like seeing like oh okay because I mean I like I said preachers kids so I wasn't yeah. even allowed to listen to rap till I was like twelve and thirteen. Right, and I probably wasn't allowed to then. I was just listening to it at that point, you know. <laughs> yeah, but. Of course, like to see that, that those are my first rap experiences in yeah. any kind of way, like inside a church. And right. I also think it's dope too, because like they want us to think a certain way. But it's like when I think of some of the greatest artists who have ever existed, 
from uh, uh, Al Green all the way to, I mean, I, I want to say even like Dolly Parton or somebody, yeah. they all started in church. Yes. And so, like, it just, I don't know, it's part of my, when I said earlier, I was discovering my identity way more. It's just like certain things that start to hit me, like a ton of bricks, like, bro, like, this was literally where you come from. And so I remember seeing Var G. Yeah. I remember when um, we had a group called the Butler Boys yeah. from Houston. They came in, they had a remix to Yolanda Adams, uh, I Got the Victory. Yeah. You know how everybody gospel songs and then yep. they adding the beat they add that's the beat literally what they did they was ahead of their time Dang. they was that was in 2012 2013 Dang. but the one that really uh who messed me up and i'm pretty sure you know big al from Monroe. yeah big al big al yes. so big al bro i seen big al for the first time i think i was 13 yeah and it was it was at a youth conference or like a, a we used to have so you know sundays they have like a youth service yep. on certain sundays and so the three o'clock youth service, there was like, it's going to be a gospel rapper. Man, Big Al used to know how to remix like the hip hop songs and make the gospel versions of them. But he was not corny. Right. He right. was not corny. Man, he came out there. He could, he, he could spit and he know how to like, he he's super, he's an entertainer. Right. Like Big Al could host anything. Nah, like, he got he a personality. Host, he definitely he got, got a personality. Person out the wazoo. So like he hopped on there. He had the Snoop Dogg flow. He was out there like just going crazy. And I was just like, who is this dude? And so then he would work in some of his original songs yeah. into his set. Yeah. And so that was the first time I ever seen Big Al perform. I went home. I told my daddy. We told our youth leader. It was like, yo, Big Al got to come to our church. Like, <sighs> hey, I'm telling you, that's what we, that's what the kids need. That's so like, dope. that's when I'm I'm learning like the, the want for it and the the impact that it really has right. on kids and, and what we was. I still remember that to this day, bruh. <laughs> I don't know how much Big Al was taxing, but the church did not want to pay it. <laughs> Bro, we was washing cars, selling pizza. We just was trying to get to him in. Just to get, just to get him to come perform. And they couldn't understand. It was like, I was trying to get a rapper to come perform. Yeah. You know, and we we made it happen. Big Al pulled up, killed the show. I was Trill Will at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember I was I used to work on the sound and make sure everything sounded right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so when he came, I was like, I had to make sure that like his, cause I wanted everybody, I hate, you know, as a rapper, I'm like, man, you got to have your 808s knocking. You got to have, have the mic. And I knew, I said, if I leave it up to somebody else, I just knew, I was like, I got to do it. It ain't going to so be right. It ain't going to be right, man. bro. Oh, so, got it right. That was the first time I met him. I think four years later when I started rapping myself, when I completely like was like, all right, I'm going to do this for the kingdom. Yeah. I think it was, uh, I was 18. I'm a freshman in college. He was performing in Rustin. So I just pulled up on him and I shook his hand. I was like, you remember me? Gave him a CD. He invited me to perform at one of his things. And it just kind of, that was a big moment in my- uh, That's huge. Pretty, pretty much like leading up to even reach. Yeah. Because like, even through that journey, that's when I discovered like, oh, this is Lecrae. You, you can't avoid Lecrae right. forever. It's right. like, he going to pop up. He going to pop up somewhere. I, I remember somebody introduced me as Lecrae. There was like, <laughs> it was like, and listen, it was crazy because I didn't know who he was at the time. And it was like, it was like, all right, we couldn't get Lecrae. And I was like, dang, and it's like, but we got this other guy. Oh and I was just like, dang. I was like, okay. And so and that, people that was, that be, was people be the worst sometimes. <laughs> Nah, but that was, but it was, it was crazy because you know me. I'm just like, okay, let me look this, look up who this look up is. Who he is though. Yeah. So that's when, that's pretty much even when I got the church clothes, and you know, I'm getting way off now. Yeah. But that, yeah. that's the that's the background. Like right. it was always like presented to me in that light, and so it got to the point when once I got old enough to like, I guess, do it myself and yeah. know what I wanted to do. Yeah. I kind of understood, like, all right. I mean, I can remember like going to just all these churches, and it was like, if I can get black people to like me in church, yeah, bro, then I got something. Because that you is the something. hardest, in my opinion, it's like three hard places to perform at HBCU, yeah, open mic night like Apollo or something like yep, that, yep. Church and church, don't bro. Nobody want to hear you in church. Don't nobody want to hear that, bro. You gotta win them. You gotta win them. You gotta convince yeah. them. Nah, yeah. that's so real, bro. You, your breakdown of this has been really good for me because I feel like, I feel like my my desire is to. Here's why. Here's why I bring it up. <clears throat> I have watched Christian hip hop evolve over the years in various ways. Music got better. Beats was crazier. People yeah. start. More people started doing it. But the thing that never showed up was the infrastructure so that if, you know, a young dude out of Rustin say, I want to rap, 
he can do it. And it, yeah. there be a thing in place for him to go do it. Like, oh, uh, yeah, man, well, let me, you know, because I'm, t- I'm explaining to one dude, I'm like, mainstream-wise, this is what they doing. Hey, dude got talent. All right, let's let's run him to the let's run him to the label. See if they want to sign him. They sign him. Hey, we yeah. gonna start putting you in these clubs. We gonna get you playing. We gonna break you as an artist. You gonna start putting out mixtapes. We gonna have them up here. Do this. Do that. And I mean, you know the route they they run them on. And by the time they get them going, like Lil Baby had three, four mixtapes before he he popped off with with what he did with Drake right. and everything else. And it's like, but you don't know that. You just like, oh, dude just showed up and he dope, so he here. And it's like, nah, QC was breaking this dude. They was building him up in the clubs, doing whatever. I'm like, we don't have that. Now, we do have, by God's grace, churches that will say, come in and play. And I feel like, just like you mentioned, Dolly Parton, and just like you mentioned, um, you know, Whitney Houston, Luther Vandross, whoever, like, these people started in church. So church was definitely a breeding ground for people's talent. So I never want to knock church or the God factor that comes along with that. But at some point when it's time to be professional at what this is, where do they go? Whitney Houston had Clive, who had a label, who had people putting a machine behind it. Dolly Parton had RCA and a machine behind her. Like, But where where do these people go who want to do Christian hip-hop? And I was like, if we keep calling it Christian hip-hop without the infrastructure, what we end up doing is putting people in a position to have to do the very things that we've had to do where it's like nothing exists and I got to create it as I try to be what I am and live that out. And I'm like, are we just going to keep doing the same thing or is something going to be created? Like with Big Al saying, yo, come rock with me, man. Come do this. And then Mm -hmm. if there was something in place, he could be like, well, I'm going to run you here, connect you with so-and-so, or I'm going to do this. But it's not there. So I'm just, my fear is my heart, the heartbreaking thing is like, okay, this doesn't exist yet, but it should. And then the fear is, what ends up happening is, you got this little bitty pond of people who all call themselves this thing. And on the inside of it, it's like, you know, man, it's a community and everybody do it together. That's dope. But in reality, you got everybody cannibalizing one another for their own project to make sense, be seen, get heard, be put on, so to speak. And what could be a community of people on a mission together becomes people's like basketball, blocking out one another to try to make sure they get their word in or get their thing going. And it's like, they don't have to do that in hip-hop, though. They it, it happens, but the pool is so big, they don't have to do that. Now, I, I you know, and, and people would say like, man, but, you know, it's Christian, though. The world ain't gonna rock with this. And it's like, you could say that to an extent, but I like you said, I've gone to HBCUs, played the crowd, felt like I was trash because they not moving and got to win them. But when I do, they with me for life. And it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm I just like any other world. It ain't about it, it. It can be a faith element that they don't get down with. But that's an excuse we use. You just got to go be good enough to win them over. 